bum 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 bum
cartoons. I wasn't so much into like action cartoons. You were an Animaniacs kid. I did like Animaniacs and Tiny Toons yep. and Freakazoid and Garfield. I was yep. a huge Garfield fan. But every now and again, you would bump into the turtles. I only have one super specific childhood memory that uh, has to do anything to do with the turtles. And it must have been second or first grade when, uh, like, on top of not being able to watch cartoons any other time of the week, I decided to give up watching cartoons for Lent. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. And my very best friend at the time, we had a very sad breakup in third grade um, that I still carry with me in my heart, Um was Tina, and she lived right next door, and her family was Muslim. So she like was like, well, you're not going to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I'm going to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And so I listened to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with my back to the television while she watched it, and I was being so pious. I was just like, oh man, this has got to count twice because I'm just <laughs> suffering just listening to it when I really want to turn around and watch it. Oh my gosh, Lisa. But if I saw any Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it was at Tina's house uh-huh, uh-huh. because she she was really super into it. Uh, I, I was also very much into the cartoons and, and I came to the cartoons first, I think like a lot of kids my age before I ever saw the, the comic books. And honestly, I didn't come to the comic books until much later in life. I was really into uh, the Turtles in Time arcade game. Okay. Uh, I was obsessed with that game for a long time. I'm still obsessed with that game. I I need to play that again. Um, but it, it's interesting when we became friends with Brian, the turtle dork, uh, and, and he had such an intense passion for the turtles of all the varying flavors, uh, cartoons, movies, uh, comic books, and 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 through our friendship with him uh, over the course of all these years that we've been podcasting with him over at the In the Mouth of Darkness, I have like I've re I re fell in love with the turtles and I started to explore uh, the avenues of turtles that I had not explored before. You know, back in high school, I had read the uh, Eastman and Laird comics, but I didn't read that whole run. And it's only recently that I've gone back and I've started plowing through those. Uh, in chronological order, and also exploring, you know, the Michael Zuli stuff, the Richard Corbin stuff, um, uh, you know, the Image Comics, and now the IDW rebranding of the Image Comics under Urban Legends. And it's it, like, Turtles, Turtles for me is like Star Wars or Marvel Comics or DC Comics. They're They're one of my true loves. And so to have... Kevin Eastman on our show, I mean, it really does mean the world to me. Uh, and and I, I really want to get him back on so we can both, like, have a proper breakdown of this very interesting relationship between these four brothers and their father, Splinter. Um, and I think there's, like, a month of episodes that we could do here on the podcast talking about sibling love. Positively. Sibling love as a person with three siblings myself is endlessly interesting to me. And as an only child, it's also endlessly interesting to me. And um, and I haven't read any of the Turtles comics, so I think that that would be a super easy in for me. So we're going to do that for sure. Now, I, I want to do like a quick, brief uh, history lesson for anybody who's been living under a rock for the last 40 years, and you don't really have any idea of uh, the historical context that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, are placed. So I, here, here's like uh, um, a quick Goodreads esque rundown. All <laughs> okay. right. So, some point in 1984, uh, Kevin Eastman rented a room in his cartoonist buddy Peter Laird's home in Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, it was there that they formed their comics company, Mirage Studios, because the studio literally was a mirage, a figment of their imagination, right? It was a dream, a fantasy. And one night, while Peter was watching TV, Kevin was goofing around on a on a drawing that that he was just you know he he likes to get to, to get a laugh out of Peter, so he's doodling right, mm-hmm. and he doodles the first Ninja Turtle, and he showed it to Peter, who found it more than a little amusing. Uh, he then took a crack at the design, and suddenly the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were born. 
uh, this would be their next project, and they threw everything of themselves into the first issue. It was a riff on the designs and dynamics of Jack Kirby, while also paying tremendous homage to Frank Miller's Daredevil. Uh, you know, the foot, duh, they are the hand. In fact, Lisa, you know, before doing this interview, I reread the first issue, and if you go back to the origin of the turtles, I forgot that the radioactive chemical accident that birthed Matt Murdock um, also was the site of mutation that 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 gave us Splinter and the Ninja Turtles. So they're like Ooze Brothers? Yeah, they're Ooze Brothers. That's right. Uh, and so Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comes out. Uh, they printed 3,250 copies of the first issue on cheap newsprint. And that ca- that comic book did gangbusters and would require multiple print runs. And all of those issues will cost you more than a pretty penny if you want to add them to your collection today. I always wanted one, um, but never got my hands on one uh, outside of the paperback collected editions because I'm not a millionaire. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, as Lisa and I have already chatted about, you know, TMNT did not become the global phenomenon until the Playmates toy deals was struck and the cartoon series quickly followed in 1987. And uh, I don't... Lisa, you did not have any of those turtle toys? No, my little brother did have some turtle toys, but he was... He's four years younger than me. Yeah. And, and they were, like, weird. They were, like, spacemen or something. Yeah, I mean, the, the turtle toys, uh, the, the longer in that initial run they went, they got stranger and stranger. There's, like, a Star Trek series that that are actually still in the, our love nest over here. <laughs> um, but uh, those toys were as important to uh, my relationship with Ninja Turtles as the cartoons or the movies were. Uh, that line was just... That was an epic line. It, it challenged G.I. Joe and Master of the Universe, no problem. Um, but, you know, like I said, since then, uh, we've had countless variations of the comic books, cartoons, movies, and toys. And that's really the brilliance of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got these four core characters. They're brothers. They fight ninjas and interdimensional beings every once in a while. Uh, but beyond that, you can have these guys pretty much do anything. And it's sort of like once you've established the rules, you know, Hellboy is a canvas for all kinds of creators to have fun with. You know, it's Mike Mignola's baby, but he invites people in and they do weird tales here and there. Same deal with like Stan Sakai's Usagi Ojimbo. You know, here are the rules, here's the world. But within those uh, those rules, you can do pretty much anything. And we talk a little bit about that in this interview. If this is your first time listening to Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast, welcome. Yeah. We thank you. We already like you a lot. Hope you stick around. Please do. We've got lots of great conversations with comic book creators like Stephen R. Bissett, Cuddles and Rage, and Joe Kelly in our catalog, and we've got lots more in our near future. But on top of that, each month we tackle a new comic book couple and dissect their relationship with the help of an expert as our love guru. Currently, we are interrupting our series on Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon using Dr. Roberta M. Gilbert's book, Extraordinary Relationships as Our Guide. Yeah, so welcome to the show, gang. We really appreciate having you there. But without further ado, you're like, guys, stop rambling. We're here to talk to Kevin. Let's listen to Kevin. Here you go. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Cowabunga, dude. Hi, Kevin. How are you today? I'm great, Brad. Thanks. How are you? I spent the morning uh, going over the uh, deluxe uh, Road to 100 issue that IDW put out of Ninja Turtles, and I was really enjoying the oral history in the back of that collection. Thank you. No, that was um, this really wonderful writer, Patrick, um, came in over a series of, because as we Marched down the road to 100 starting in January of last year. Um, Tom Waltz and I and Bobby Kernow and uh, many of the other artists that were involved in the series beforehand and then throughout the, the completion to 100. Um, he came in about, um, I think it was over a span of, I think, maybe three or four months. And he came in twice monthly and, and have his wonderfully organized notes and would sort of go through different remembrances and issues and points and things in different arcs. And I, I thought it was just run, really well put together, for sure. Well, I'm struck by how much um, not only the turtles have evolved since the creation, but how much you have, as a creator has evolved. And I'm just kind of wondering what your 
what insight you can give on uh, evolution and, you know, staying in the game, returning to these characters, like what tips you can offer for lasting as long as you have? Well, it's a, it's a great question because it really is, um, it's almost like um, uh, you're driving the car, but the fans have the roadmap. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, and meaning that, you know, it's it sort of, you have ideas and different things that come into the, I call the turtle universe or universes, um, because we've started with the original, you know, black and white Kevin Eastman Peter Laird universe, which led to you know, the cartoon shows and the toys and the movies, which is I segment as a different kind of universe because, um, you know, it's written for a much younger audience and, and the ideas that we explored within that universe led to almost like a snowball effect of more ideas led to more ideas. And we work, got to work with some wonderfully creative people, not only in the animation side, but the comic book side. And as that sort of waned and you thought, well, that was awesome. And what a great time, what a great ride and counter blessings. That was great. And then, you know, uh, we got an opportunity to do a resurgence, to do a new series in the 2000s. Um, and that was, again, uh, wonderfully um, uh, embraced by the fans, some of the older ones, and we brought in some new fans, and that was a different kind of adventure with a different kind of turtle universe. Things were tweaked and nudged and made a little bit fresher and updated <clears throat> um, for that time period. And then which bled into the, as that sort of waned, we did the 2007 um Turtles animated movie, then it took a break for a while before Nickelodeon um, Viacom bought the property in uh, the 2010-ish, 2009, 2010, and that led into um, this whole new Viacom resurgence with Nickelodeon as a, not only as a wonderfully produced cartoon series, um, but IDW picked up the comic rights. And what continues throughout this process of keeping it fresh and keeping it exciting is these new writers uh, and artists and things that came into the mix and what I found so enjoyable and such a, a wonderful treasure in this most recent say I came back into the series All Things Turtle in 2011 but it was a lot of these kids that were producing you know Cyril Neely who was producing the animated series grew up as a fan of the original Turtles comics and Turtles cartoons and so he brought his love and passion to the turtles from his childhood memories to this Nickelodeon series that was so wonderful. And the same for guys like Tom Waltz, who's the head writer who literally wrote all 100 issues, and, and Bobby Chernow, the series editor, but all these young artists that came in to bring these stories to life in the 100 issue run at IDW were originally um, inspired by the turtles in some way, um, some more intensely than others, but that's the fresh blood, the fresh ideas, just when you think you've run out of every possible conceivable idea you could do <laughs> you know, after you know, 300 cartoon shows and multiple movies and all the stuff and these wonderfully talented people come in and, and with fresh ideas and it excites me and that's the collaborative thing that um, excites me creatively and I feel like if we approach it in that sense of uh, if it's fresh and exciting to me hopefully that will resonate with the fan mm. so, um, and that seems to be a that work so it is really passion and inspiration i guess is the key what i've always appreciated about the turtles going all the way back to those comics is that collaboration you know you would get guys like richard corbin and, and jim lawson and and michael zuli to add their little flavor to your characters and that has continued uh through uh the idw run you know you've you've made it a mission to lift voices up in the comic book community. And uh, I, I wonder, like, where did that come from? Where, where did that passion for not only the art and your characters, but all the artists that can contribute? Well, it really goes back to, um, you know, when both Peter and I were reading comic books when we were younger, the kind of books we were reading, whether it be Batman or, you know, Daredevil or the Avengers or X-Men and things, you had, you know, some of the guys that originally traded it, say, Stanley and Jack Kirby, but then you'd have this evolution of, you know, like Steve Ditko coming in on Spider-Man or, you know, Frank Miller on Daredevil and these things that you'd have different art teams um, bring their their vision of that character. And you'd have sort of a um, an overseer of Marvel, say, say it's Stan Lee, that would sort of keep the character true to what that person, what the company thinks that that character should be. But you still have room to let these talented people come in and bring their ideas to that character. And some of those 
run, say a particular writer and artist that say worked on a year's worth of issues, twelve issues, some you like a lot, mm-hmm. some you like a little bit less, but your love of the character sort of prevailed over uh, everything overarching. I mean, I still uh, remember so clearly, like it was yesterday, when Frank Miller came on to Daredevil. Daredevil was one of my longtime childhood favorite characters. He came on as a pencil in Daredevil 158, and it was like, hey, this guy's this guy's pretty good. He's writing with uh, Roger McKenzie. Then Frank Miller blossomed and, and gave us this run of 30 issues that was just so game-changing and mind-blowing and, and, and such a great run for that character, one of my favorite characters. That was really one of the high points. You know, Even today, I still love Daredevil. I still buy Daredevil comic books with this sort of moments and creators that... Um, bring such a specific bright light to it. And that's what we took in our approach to the turtles is that, you know, and I, a great idea is a great idea and you're stupid to not embrace it if no matter who brings it to the table. So when artists like you mentioned, Michael Zuli, who did a fantastic run of, uh, um, this more realistic take on the turtles. Um, he brought an idea and a vision and Pete and I both thought it was a great variation to what, uh, we designed as a characters, but he still kept, the heart and soul, the, the meat of the character is still intact, the Splinter and the Turtles and the family aspect and that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's that collaborative energy that um, you want to give different creators the opportunity to tell a story with your characters. You know, you sort of look over their shoulder a little bit and make sure they don't step too far out of line. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you give them the reins to um, really have some creative and free, creative freedom and bring a, a great idea to fruition that we, we all end up enjoying. So when you talk about the core of the turtles uh, and allowing for variation, but what is the element of these characters uh, that that should not be bent? Like what what is what is that core element that everyone really should stick to when uh, playing with these figures, these characters? Well, I think it's um, you know, and we've tried in uh, just through trial and error too. We've tried different things where there's just. Um, the component of, say, personalities. Um, and, you know, everybody, and this is, you know, Courtney and I do conventions all over the world, or used to, and we will again, but, um, mm. you know, one of the things I always ask fans is, you know, who's your favorite turtle and why? Because you can tell a lot about that person just by who their favorite turtle is. If, you know, they like Raphael, if they, you know, they like Donatello, they're kind of geeky. If there's Michelangelo, uh, techno geeky, I mean, if they're Michelangelo, they're, they're the funny one of the bunch, or if they're Leonardo, is sort of more of this leader thing. But um, so, if you push that dynamic of specific characters' personalities um, too far out of whack, then it makes the fans uncomfortable because that's not the, you know, if you like Wolverine, you like Wolverine for this reason. If you like, you know, Daredevil, you like it for that reason. So we, we can't mess with that. We also try not to mess too much with um, the family dynamic of, you know, that. Peter Parker, I'm a high school teenager and I still have to deal with life at school but I'm also Spider-Man and so there's that underground sort of we have to keep secret, we can't come out in the public um, the way, you know um, you know other people can because that's our nature as ninjas and we just want to be teenagers but there's this forces of evil that sort of keep us repressed um, the adoptive family with Splinter, so there's, you know in, in, and so you can play within those parameters but that seems to be I guess the family aspect and the personality seem to be the, the, the one that keeps it closest to what fans will allow um, different variations as long as you keep those basic components intact. So. Mm. Uh, uh, I also host a film series for the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia, uh, celebrating uh, films from the oh, 90s wonderful. to today. And right before Shelter in Place went down, we were going to screen the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, and we had sold it out. And we were super excited to bring it to our audience. Uh, and we will bring it to our audience once uh, this can all open up again in some safe fashion. Um, but looking back on that film, I am, I, you know, I had to watch it again. And, and, I was amazed at how much of a miracle of a little low budget movie that was in the same fashion that the original comic book was. And I I just kind of be curious to get your point of view on that 30 years later of that experience of first bringing them to the, the, the big screen and 
what works so well and, and what was the magic of that uh, collaboration? Um, great question. And, and what I love is that, um, uh, like, see, Courtney and I are lucky enough to do um, conventions all over the all over the world. And we did do, um, we have done in the past, and actually one at Alamo Draft House where we did a screening of the first Turtle movie mm-hmm. um, to a sold out audience. And I did live commentary over the mm-hmm. over the viewing of it, which was just the, the coolest, funnest, most awesome event ever. It was just uh, it was really a, a, a treat. But, um, directly the answer to the question is the perfect storm of what happened with that movie is like you clearly and in, in appropriately referenced Turtles issue one um, what Peter and I did with that it was just it just probably could not have happened any other time than that time and the instances that sort of had to happen of me going here to there to this to actually have Peter and I meet and then evolve into this friendship that became the co-creators of the Turtles um, that movie was the same one. We were very nervous to go into a live action movie because we had a, a wonderfully successful cartoon show, comic book and toy line. And the pro- the thing was, if we can't bring these characters to life and make them believable on screen, then we've lost from, from you know, the first yard line. Hmm. In comes Steve Barron, who is such a wonderful visionary director and storyteller. He brings his relationship with Jim Henson into play. Henson brings the characters to life um, visually and uh, wonderful Todd Langdon wrote the script for the series but it was again that perfect storm that too many things had to happen in a happy accident fashion to line those stars in just the right way to make that 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 event work as a movie and, and my goodness it is still um, you know the my favorite all time favorite just because it was wonderfully written directed and it still holds up today but it was written and approached as a film for all ages, not just a kid's movie um, or not just an adult movie. So it wasn't so edgy that, you know, it made um, parents uncomfortable that the kids were there, but it had good morals, um, good lessons, the visual stuff, and the puppetry was just fantastic. So mm. it really was uh, just a wonderful, perfect storm of um, opportunity that made that happen the way it did. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I really, really appreciate it. I've been a fan for a long time. I go to San Diego Comic-Con every year. And uh, when we get to go back to San Diego Comic-Con, I'll see you at the booth. And I hope the next time you have an opportunity to come to Virginia, we can get you for a screening of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the Alamo Draft House. Well, I'd absolutely love that. And uh, yes, next time you go to San Diego Comic Con, you better look me up and uh, and say hi. It'd be great to see you and meet you live in person. So I look forward to that. All right, take care, Kevin. Thank you so much. You have a great day. My pleasure. You as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Lisa. How uh, awesome was that conversation? How tubular was that conversation? Uh, totally. Yeah, totally tubular. Uh, Bossa Nova. Yeah, Bossa Nova for sure. <laughs> I find it so inspirational how he talks about how he takes his precious babies, the turtles, and he puts them in other artists and other creative people's hands. Yeah. That's something that you don't see anywhere else besides comics. Well, I think like Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman learned the lessons of Jack Kirby. They saw how Jack Kirby was screwed over and how he did not get the credit uh, for his creations. Um, and, And he wanted to make sure that like, that there was a universe he wanted, he wants there to be a universe for the turtles. They wanted there to be a universe for the turtles, the way that there was a universe for the Fantastic Four and Spider Man. Um, but he also knew to achieve that, he had to bring in great minds, great voices, great talents. You know, so Michael Zuli, Richard Corbin, Stephen Bissett, Rick Veach, you know, if these guys are at your disposal, if you have a chance to work with them, you would be foolish not to. Uh, off, offer them a hand off, to, to to ask them to give your characters more depth than you possibly could, right? Um, or at least a different twist on what you could give them. Uh, you know, going back and reading the comic books before this interview, uh, that's really what I was struck with. Uh, I love those initial runs of books, but when guys came on and, and did something different, and I mean. Something different? I mean, Michael Zuli's turtles are way different, but there was space and room and there was a welcome mat for that difference. And I, I, I think that is a huge lesson 
that we can learn from Eastman and Laird, right? And and everything that they did with Mirage Studios and when Kevin Eastman then went on to Tundra uh, and, and the platform that he gave people there as well. Uh, it's truly, to use your word, inspirational. Each new voice adds an indelible mark and, and a richness to the legacy of the Turtles. And guess what? They're not done. No, if anything, they're as strong as ever. Uh, you know, the Turtles cartoons, they just keep on coming. They've they have they have been the entertainment for generations, and they're going to be the entertainment for generations uh, till the end of time, probably, which hopefully won't be uh, too soon from now. <laughs> but if you go over to IDW, um, you know, their run with the Turtles is wrapping up uh, right now, and they are preparing for The Last Ronin, which is something that I'm extremely excited about. Um, you know, it's it's not just a post-apocalyptic turtle tale featuring the last surviving turtle brother. Who is it? Leo, Donnie, Mikey? Yeah, it's probably Raphael. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's based on an old Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman script that the two of them concocted back in the day. Uh, this lost 1987 uh, script was recently discovered, dusted free of cobwebs, and is going to be brought back to life with the help of Andy Kuhn and Tom Waltz. I don't know about you, Lisa, but... You know, I'm I'm in to total uh, turtle frenzy all over again, and I, I'm just so excited to see how these characters are going to continue to evolve through the lens of so many different people. But because Eastman is still in the thick of it, you know, working side by side with all these people, it it, it feels authentic. It, it it has not strayed into wonky or awkward territory. It's it's. It's still turtles. If you want to get a, just a really nice overview of the turtles and their history, I highly recommend the documentary Turtle Power, The Definitive History of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's written and directed by Randall Lobb. It's got interviews with Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird and a bunch of those dudes who were really scruffing it in the early days of the Mirage Studios. Yeah, it's a great, great documentary. Even as like a not a hardcore turtle fan, I found it really inspiring. Even the name Mirage Studios, that that thing of like our dream isn't real, but we can just by just saying it's a thing, we're now this thing. And when you watch that documentary, like what you sh you should aspire to be like Kevin Eastman, right? Because he and Peter Laird, they create this comic book out of their uh, their rooms, out of their homes, and it becomes this massive phenomenon. They, they did it in a way that nobody had done before. Right, right. And suddenly it's bigger than, than, than they ever thought it would be. And how do you manage that? How do you still make comic books? There's a, a ton of heartache. There's ups and downs. There are broken relationships. There are you know, beautiful, joyful reunions. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and so like where Kevin Eastman is now, where you heard him in this interview, he's not the owner of the Ninja Turtles anymore. He's a work for hire guy, but he's the creator. And at least the companies that are hiring him treat him with the respect. They go to him. They know that he's the voice. He's the source to use a Jack Kirby uh, term. Uh, and, and, and all of that stuff is really great in the Turtle Power documentary. Lisa's totally right about that. I would also recommend if you haven't already gotten your full of Kevin Eastman and how could you, uh, head on over to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel uh, because I think on the same day that Kevin spoke to us, he also spoke to Jim Rugg and Ed Piskor. And of course, they're a little bit bigger deal than Brad and Lisa. So they got a little more time than we did. They get about four 40 minutes with Kevin Eastman, and they talk about things uh, totally different than what we talked about here on uh, the podcast. So give them a listen, give them a subscribe. They're almost at 20,000 uh, subscribers, so... Good on them. them. Why aren't they sending some of those our way? The Comic Book Couples <laughs> Counseling Podcast. So next week, we're returning to our conversation surrounding the on-again, off-again romance between Dick Grayson, Robin the Boy Wonder, and Barbara Gordon, Batgirl. Last week, we kicked off this series of episodes by exploring Batgirl Year One, but... In reality, I know that Brad really wanted to start things off with the classic Bronze Age comic book series, Batman Family. Yeah, I did. Where Robin and Batgirl first teamed up in the 70s for a variety of wacky adventures. And I'm telling you folks, 
These things are wild. <laughs> yeah. uh, nabbing those Batman family issues seemed a little too expensive at the time. Uh, but then a faithful listener, uh, Tony Sapone, uh, a.k.a. Seven underscore Soldiers on Twitter, reminded us that most of those issues were recently collected in the Robin Bronze Age omnibus. Well, guess what? Uh, we got a hold of that beast. It's a tome. It's massive. So next week, we'll be covering four specific issues that speak directly to the budding romance between Dick Dick and Babs, Batman family numbers 1, 11, 13, and 15. Yes, those numbers sound random, but trust us, they most certainly are not. Get to reading. Yes, indeed. All right, Lisa, we got to get the shell out of here. <laughs> Where can our listeners find you online? Where can they send their words of affirmation to you? That's so sweet. I'm always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. Don't forget you can email the podcast by writing to cbccpodcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. And Brad, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you, my friend? You can find me on all social medias at MouthDork, and you can commit to this podcast by following us on Instagram and Twitter at CBCC Podcast, by subscribing to us on Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. And while you're on iTunes, why don't you give us the gift of five stars? It really warms our heart and helps the podcast. That it does. It really does. So until next time, folks, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopy doopy.